Complications of Peritoneal Dialysis by Dr. Sharon Sue. Introduction. Uh, hello, um, my name is Dr. Sharon Su, a pediatric nephrologist. Today I'm going to talk to you about peritoneal dialysis. Dialysis catheters. One question that often comes up is when can you use a dialysis catheter? This depends on uh, the situation of the patient. If it is acute peritoneal dialysis, the reason you put in the catheter is because you need to start dialysis immediately. However, if it's chronic, as in it's planned for a patient that is reaching end-stage renal disease or currently has a vascular catheter for hemodialysis but will be transitioning to peritoneal dialysis, uh, then you have a little bit more time. If you're going to use the catheter or to perform peritoneal dialysis immediately, it's very important to just start with very slow or small fill volumes. Um, that way you will reduce the chance of leakage. Um, ideally, if you do have um, time to wait, you want the site to uh, heal well and seal off from leakage. So if you put in a catheter and you can wait because you have other forms of renal replacement therapy, such as hemodialysis, then I would recommend waiting two to four weeks before starting peritoneal dialysis. Another thing to consider is that there are different types of catheters. If, in general, for a chronic peritoneal dialysis, catheters that are cuffed, as well as um, swan neck, which means they um, curl up at the end so that they reduce the risk of touching other or organs and causing blockage. Those theoretically reduce the risk of infection. They are used for uh, patients who will be on chronic um, peritoneal dialysis. Cuffed catheters are also tunneled, so they're tunneled through different layers of the skin from the epidermis to the sub-Q layers and then into the abdominal cavity. So those are made so that the risk of infection is less. They have to be removed in the OR because they are tunneled and cuffed. So you can't just cut the stitches and pull it out. Simple straight catheters that are not cuffed um, are easily placed and also easily removed. Like, but these um, have a higher chance of leakage. If a patient has a G-tube that's been in place and well healed and sealed, one can put in a peritoneal dialysis catheter and there should be no problems. Or Sometimes a G-tube is placed at the same time as a peritoneal dialysis catheter. In that case, one should be pretty careful in how much fill volume you're going to fill into the peritoneal cavity. Complications with peritoneal dialysis. Peritonitis is a major complication of peritoneal dialysis. 50% of the organisms come from gram positive, such as staph aureus, staph epidermis, streptococcus, or enterococcus. 15% come from gram-negative organisms such as pseudomonas, anaerobes, or E. coli. Others uh, have my polymicrobial, so a component of both pos gram-positive and gram-negative. This accounts for 4%, and less than 2% are caused by fungal. What are the signs and symptoms of peritonitis? This includes fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, cloudy effluent, increased fibrin, and slow or difficult flow of dialysis fluid, whether this is filling or draining. Diagnosing peritonitis includes identifying the cloudy effluent, uh, fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius, uh, cell differential count where the WBC is greater than 100, and 50% of the white cells are neutrophils. A positive gram stain can also help you diagnose peritonitis, as well as positive cultures from the peritoneal dialysis fluid. The wonderful thing about um, peritoneal dialysis is that you can treat the peritonitis by giving or adding the antibiotic right into the peritoneal dialysis fluid. So you do not need to give systemic antibiotics. In fact, giving it into the peritoneal dialysis fluid is, is more efficacious as it hits the source of the infection. There are many antibiotics that can be added into the peritoneal dialysis bag. Uh, this will be dependent on the institution what you have available. Um, and there are different doses that are recommended. There are loading doses as well as maintenance doses. If you look at this table, there's a list of the medications such as cefazolin, cefepime, ceftazidime, as well as gentamicin, vancomycin, uh, ciprofloxacin, fluconazole. 
For the latest update on antibiotic doses, see ISPD guidelines and recommendations. In general, the loading dose you want to leave in for about three hours, and then you uh, change the dose to a maintenance dose, which means you change the dialysis fluid bag and you add in a different concentration of antibiotic. Usually treatment doses, you want to do about two hour cycles, and you want to do this around the clock, so continuous dialysis, until you notice that the drain fluid is clear. Uh, generally, you treat for 14 days. You can do um, shorter cycles. Again, if you do more exchanges, the idea is you flush out the organisms. So you do not have to do two hour cycles. You can do one hour cycles. However, this uh, may be more labor intensive as then you have to continue to add uh, antibiotics to your dialysis bags. Another complication is leakage of peritoneal dialysis fluid. This causes many problems such as infection, not just for peritonitis, but as well as cellulitis, as well as poor efficacy of dialysis. Dialysis fluid is caustic to the skin because it includes electrolytes and the leakage can irritate the exit site. Furthermore, the dextrose is a perfect energy source for organisms like bacteria. And so leakage places a high risk for developing infections. Manage the leakage by decreasing the fill volume. Sometimes you may have to stop dialysis and allow the area to heal and then start again at a lower fill volume. A third complication is decreased ultrafiltration. This can occur if the catheter is blocked by such thing as blood, fibrin, sticking to the omentum, the bowel, the bladder, or the liver, basically any organ. Catheters uh, may be blocked if you drain too long and dry out the patient. That is why usually the drain time is about 10 minutes. It is good to leave a little bit of fluid in the peritoneal cavity so that the catheter is more freely floating and not sitting there and have access to other organs. The way to remove the blockage is to flush the catheter. It's best to flush and not aspirate or pull back, better to just flush into the peritoneal cavity. It's very important that you do this with sterile technique and you can flush with 10 to 20 milliliters normal saline. I would recommend at least two flushes. Sometimes you can reposition the patient to try to move the catheter from whatever organ it's touching. And you can also get an abdominal x-ray to check the location of the catheter. A fourth complication is the presence of fibrin in the effluent. And this can occur from bleeding, and this often occurs when the catheter is initially placed. To remove the fibrin, you can flush the catheter, again, same method as managing the blockage. You can also flush through increasing the cycles. So you flush the entire tubing set and the catheter. And finally, as long as the patient is not at high risk for bleeding, you can add heparin into the dialysate. In general, this does not lead to systemic anticoagulation. Recommended doses of adding heparin into the dialysate is about 250 units per liter or 500 units per liter. This concludes the video on complications of peritoneal dialysis. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.